Hey Pete, how are you today? I'm good. Uh, all the better for seeing you and uh, <laughs> participating in this. Is it relatively new podcast? Pretty new. We've we've done this. Will be our seventh one that we release, and we have some in the chamber still that are being edited. So it's it's very new as of 2022. Very good, brilliant. Yeah. Very yeah. good. You're giving me you're filling me in a little bit before we started recording, but I like what you're you're doing with it and the kind of the angle, the political and theoretical angle. So uh, glad to be your seventh, uh, especially because seven is what the number of perfection. So let's yeah. make sure that's the best one yet. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. That's great. It is an honor to have you on as seventh feet and appreciate your time and presence here today. So I was wondering if we could start off with a question kind of about you. And uh, so, so you've been doing a lot of interesting theoretical and philosophical theological theological work uh, that that I love personally. But I'm curious, like, how did we get here? So could you say a little bit about your intellectual development, kind of what motivated your interest in topics like theology, psychoanalysis, continental philosophy, that kind of thing? Absolutely. And maybe uh, it's worth saying that um, I'm a little bit unusual in that way, in that I showed no intellectual ability at all in my youth, in my, um, I spoke very late. Uh, they thought I had a problem, like some sort of issue because I didn't talk at all when I was very young. Um, didn't walk very quickly either. I was very slow in doing everything. Uh, went through school, uh, not only uh, not exceptional, but not even very good. Um, I had tonsillitis for a year during what's called the 11 plus at the age of 11, you do this exam in the UK and it, it was to decide whether you went to a, a public school or a grammar school. The grammar school is much more intellectual, the public school less so and more practical. Um, I didn't even do the 11 plus, but they just kind of went like, he probably have failed. So I went into the grammar school system and almost didn't even do GCSEs, which are what you do to get into um, what are called A-levels, which then get you into university. So two levels down from university, and they thought, nah, Pete doesn't have what it takes to do that. So I kind of, I left school when I was 16 years old and mucked around for a while, didn't do much. So I'm giving that a little background, partly so as hopefully if someone's listening to this and going, I've suddenly become into, interested in the intellectual life, but I'm, I don't think I'm any good at it. I don't haven't got any background. Use me as an example, um, as someone who discovered this reasonably late. Um, and, and what clicked it is, is in one sense weird and in another sense not, but what clicked it was when I was 17 years old, I had kind of a religious experience um, in a kind of like, you know, in the in the more profound meaning of that term, which is, you know, not an experience of something, but that which changes your experience of everything. And I had this reconfiguration that was connected actually with a, with a conservative church, evangelical church at the time, but what happened there, interestingly, and I'm sure we'll talk about this a lot in the podcast, is that was my first experience of, to put it another way, to say negativity. To, and my experience of something that was nothing that I couldn't articulate and explain. Something happened that fundamentally short-circuited me, that I didn't have the conceptual or experiential tools to to kind of place in my mind, to kind of the categories required. And that sparked off in me a profound desire to find tools to understand what had happened and what was going on. And I used the tools that were around me at the time, confessional Christianity. But that also then eventually or quickly drew me to philosophy. And that, now, giving you that little background, I'll do the next bit quickly uh, for you, just to give you my kind of credentials. Um, I started in analytic philosophy because I never knew there were two types. People outside of philosophy don't know that there's broadly two schools. Uh, as you know, there's analytic and continental. And I started in analytic philosophy and quickly realized this was not somewhere that I felt comfortable. But my, my university had an, a, a continental department. They had analytic philosophy and continental philosophy, which is rare, actually. So I discovered continental philosophy. And my first major impact was probably Heidegger. Very kind of impressed with the work of Heidegger and blown away by it. And then Heidegger probably into Derrida. 
and post-structuralism. And then through that into Shizek, Lacan and Hegel. So there you go. There's kind of like my, and of course, there's lots of people in there. Marx, very important and Schopenhauer and Nietzsche, the existentialist. But if you want it in a nutshell, I went from not being able to speak very well to uh, reading Hegel. It only took me 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Pete. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, I'm struck by, maybe we'll continue to get to it, but this kind of profound moment, uh, religious experience kind of reconfigured your uh, understanding of what the world was and, and, and the quest to make sense of that um, yes. led, led you into some of these, these topics. And I'm, I am struck, I was quite moved to hear you talk about your early experience and kind of, you know, I find py pyrotheology and some of the work you're doing on psychoanalysis to be very creative and, 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 and thought provoking. And it is inspiring that you come from kind of a, a different, uh, maybe not the uh, normative or like what people would, ex would expect out, out of that, which is very inspiring. And I'm wondering if uh, you were almost weren't, I wonder what you think of this, if the experience of not having a lot of that conceptual baggage is actually helpful in a way as you're trying to understand this experience. Um, you, it seems like that, that um, led to kind of like an openness almost. Um, would you say, does that track, track for you? Absolutely that, and also my pragmatic bent <laughs> in that um, I always uh, was interested in, in how these ideas play out in terms of community life and in terms of individual life and community life. So right from the beginning, when I was doing my PhD, the driving force was like, what does this look like in terms of art and music and, and uh, life together? And in fact, I started a community called ICON really around the same time as I was doing my master's in political theory and social criticism. And I continued ICON through my PhD. And every time when I was reading someone like Derrida, my first question was, you know, what does this look like in a pub with musicians and storytellers? Mm. And what does it look like in some sort of ritualistic way? And um, I think that that has always been a part of, a part of me. Uh, that, by the way, I've always been interested in this is a true of any discipline. There's this, there's kind of like the, the theoretical dimension and the practical dimension. So sure. biology, you know, or like uh, in uh, psychoanalysis, there's a the theory of subjectivity, but there's also the clinic. Uh, in, in engineering, there's the mathematics, but there's also the bridge building. Uh, but theology, it's very, very obvious that, that there's a, like there's actually literally a weekly thing that supposedly mm. is the, the incarnation or the representation of the concepts. So I always liked theology for that sense in which that the uh, like philosophy needs a church. <laughs> it needs the it needs the two. Yeah. Thanks, Pete. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Definitely hear that. And I actually think that's a segue into another a good segue into another question I had um, with this kind of theory and praxis or theory and practice. Um, I'm very interested in how those uh, how that understanding ties into like politics, um, political theory, and then maybe a practice of organizing or something. But I'm curious before, maybe we could touch on that subject, but uh, politically for, for Pete, um, can you describe, so you talked about being in, in the UK, um, growing up in the UK, I'm wondering if you could reflect or, or chat about any of the uh, formative moments in your thinking about politics, um, whether it comes from your background or, or if there are any shifts or anything. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, absolutely. And, you know, my theoretically speaking, it's the same kind of bunch of people, um, you know, that I was interested in philosophically, theologically, or the ones that informed me politically. The background was that I grew up in the Troubles, um, which is, you know, as, as you may or may not know, but a 30 year conflict uh, in the north of Ar in Northern Ireland. And, uh, you know, a complex conflict, but one that was ostensibly about um, whether Northern Ireland should be uh, unified with the rest of Ireland, so or whether it should remain part of the United Kingdom. So Northern Ireland is part of the UK. It actually has a very special, interestingly contradictory status because when you're in Northern Ireland, you have Irish citizenship and British citizenship. You're part of the UK and you're part of Ireland, which means you're part of the European Union. And again, like it's very, really interesting space, Northern Ireland. Um, but that the troubles and also how we the troubles ended uh definitely have impacted my understanding of conflict and politics 
Uh, Northern Ireland has basically one of the most successful peace accords, uh, peace processes in the modern world. If not, the I, th I would say the most successful peace process in the modern world is, is in Northern Ireland. And I was able to personally witness that. That was happening in 1998. Um, we know when I was, I can't remember what age, I was 20, you know, 20 around my 20s. Um, and so that was important. Uh, yeah, so, you know, and also politically, I mean, there's, there's, interesting in religion, you have to be very careful with words because words have a lot of passion around them and misunderstanding around them. And I like words that have a lot of strength and a lot of power and a lot of potential misunderstanding. But politics today is like that. <laughs> so whenever you use words like the left and the right, uh, Marxism, socialism, communism, capitalism, these words are, these words have incredible um, weight. Uh, and sometimes they can be very off-putting words. And, but I don't like to get rid of them. I think they're important to try to theorize and, and redeem, but also sometimes if they get in the way, I like to find new way, different ways of communicating the same ideas. So if we're going to talk talking politics in America, especially when I came to America, I realized a lot of these terms are so loaded with meaning that um, you can get derailed very quickly. And I am no fan of uh, what is often called the left in America. So <laughs> as someone who calls myself a traditional leftist or I, you know, has done, I, I don't use that word as much because um, of, of the meaning that that word has taken on. <laughs> Thanks, Pete. Um, that makes makes a lot of sense and informed by your kind of upbringing in history and experiencing the troubles kind of on the ground is, is very formative. And then the second part about the um, power of words and the left, maybe we, we could just pause and, and uh, reflect on that for a second. So mm -hmm. you might call yourself a traditional leftist or that, that's what I was hearing. I mean, could what has historically, ha has it meant to be on the, on the left? And maybe how is that, maybe you're uh, now as an, uh, someone in America, um, what, what are some of the how is that getting derailed commonly in, in, in your experience? Could we pause on that and reflect? Oh, yeah. Reflect yeah. yeah. A fascinating topic. One I'm yeah. very interested in. We could pause okay. on it, talk about it all the rest of the time. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, so it, 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 it's, it's interesting because I'm also interested in what is the lure of the right at the moment? That's a good question. I think because there's a lure of, of the right. And the lure of the right, I think, is universalism. Um, if you look mm. online at the moment and on YouTube, the right are the people who seem to be advocating universalism. And it seems like those who call themselves the left are advocating for particularism. And that is interesting, right? Now, the, the thing for me is the right actually is not universalist, but it has, at the moment, it has the lure of universalism. And I think that's what's making it so attractive and what makes what is often called leftism so unattractive at the moment in America is it seems to be so particularistic. Um, uh, but the left for me traditionally is universalist. Now it's universalist through a particular. So it, it takes, um, it always sees the motor for the forward momentum of history in the outsider. So there's, there's this, so if, if you could say that, you know, some people say, Everybody, everybody's already at the table. Saying, saying capitalism, pretty much, you can't. It's meritocracy. Everybody can be at the table, um, and the the fantasy of it is eventually everyone will be at the table. And then somebody else says, "Well, no, lots of people are excluded from the table and need to find a place at the table." Um, and kind of the more uh, existentialist political position is, no, 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 we need to overturn the table. Um, there's something about not we should we don't want to be at that table. There's we're all outsiders. There is a certain dimension of subjectivity that means we are not natural and cultural. Which, by the way, is why I'm interested in psychoanalysis because psychoanalysis, as opposed to psychology, really in evolutionary psychology and all these other silly disciplines, um, which kind of sees human beings as natural and cultural. Um, the whole point of psychoanalysis is that humans aren't natural or cultural. We are we are distorted. We are we are like a um, we are in the world but not of it. There is something about human subjectivity that that doesn't ever fit. Uh, there's a demand, and, and when we pretend to fit or when we try to fit, um, all these you know problems happen. So Freud says civilization and its discontents. Discontent is is inherent to civilization. A certain sense of not not at oneness is part of subjectivity. Um, so so what I'm basically saying is that 
for me, um, the, well, I'll put it in Todd McGowan's terms. For me, the right has traditionally been about turning contradiction into opposition. So we have a society where there are problems and there are problems because there's something contingent wrong that if we get rid of a certain group of people or get rid of a certain thing, then everything will work and be whole. And kind of, there is a kind of organic oneness and wholeness that's being distorted. So the obvious example of that is fascism with in you know the figure of the Jew as the one who distorts the kind of the, the smooth functioning of society get rid of the Jewish community, you get rid of the de destabilizing opposition and things can work. The left, I think, has traditionally been about uh, contradiction, about seeing that the forward momentum of society is in a fundamental, fundamental historical types of contradiction that can never be fully overcome, but that every epoch creates its own contradiction and that contradiction eventually erupts into a different form of life. And hopefully that form of life can be better, but that form of life has its own contradictions. And so you can never cut out the enemy. The enemy is, is a reflection of the society and the societal problems themselves. So in a very concrete example, I live in LA, there's lots of homelessness. I could go out, be involved in a homeless organization, that would be great, giving food, to people who are homeless, giving beds to people who are homeless, et cetera, et cetera. But what I can do is I can sometimes think that I'm good news to the, the homeless, that I'm out there being good news to them. But the homeless are good news to us, to me, because the homeless are the prophetic message that there's something wrong within society, that I am participating in something that's not working. And the homeless are not the problem, they're the solution to a problem. They are the concrete sim uh, symptom of a problem within the culture that generates this issue that can then be managed through keeping the homeless in areas like Skid Row, making sure they don't leave that area. So the problem becomes concretized and then managed. But really, if we listen to the homeless, as we listen to that position and we ask ourselves, why is it there? We realize that the problem is within us, within our structure. So that for me is a, is a traditional position of the left. Got it. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Pete. That's a lot of questions coming off that, but extremely illuminating, um, thought provoking. So, something you're seeing, or something you see, kind of a critique of the contemporary left is traditionally we've tried on the left to recognize that there's kind of fun fundamental contradictions that are the motor of society. We can maybe put this in the framework of like a Marxist understanding of history or a Hegelian one, like there's different modes of productions we're moving through. Um, and then the right traditionally has kind of not affirmed uh, contradiction. They've turned it into that kind of thing that's fundamental into an opposition and tried to like uh, cut off one side of the contradiction or like scapegoat one side of the contradiction. And then so are, are you seeing that almost that there's been been like a, a reversal, at least like maybe tactically, um, in that you're seeing folk, folks on the contemporary left maybe because, um, okay, so I'm thinking of Marxism, right? We've got the bourgeois and the proletariat. And from what I'm hearing you, you say is that like property class, owner class, it's not that we need to remove them. It, it's we need to rec recognize that this contradiction is really fundamental to how capitalism is moving, moving forward. Um, but maybe in a contemporary discourse, and I think this is probably broken off into things coming out of the 60s too around uh questions of gender, race, sexism, misogyny, et cetera. These things have also come up and kind of intersected with these discussions. Yeah. Um, so yeah, is that, is that, are you sensing or seeing a reversal in, in that kind of traditional uh, scheme? Um, is that right? To, is that your view? Yeah, I mean, and it's, it's, it's kind of like in a dialectical sense, it's kind of like I would say, if you sit, give one, this position is um, a seeming uni a universal, like we're all the same. You know, uh, and then the, the negation of that is no particular. We have our particular identities, sexual identities, racial identities, da, 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 experiential identities. Then the dialectic negation of negation is it's precisely in our individual um, identities that we encounter the universal. Or it, 
um, or it's or if you've got the inside and you've got the outside, it's precisely by identifying ourselves as outsiders that is the universal. So for Alain Badiou, for example, you have the notion that what unifies, well, and this is, this is again a psychoanalytic point, is what unifies us is uh, not what we hold in common. What we hold in common will, is, will be different, but what unifies us is that we all lack, that we all to be creatures of language, to be subjects, have undergone a death. You know, there is life after death and we are the evidence, right? There is, when yeah. we're born as subjects, as when we become subjects, there's something that dies, something that we lose. Now, you know, you know, if you're, a, you know, you're, if you know, you're Lacan, what you lose is, is only a retroactive loss. It didn't exist in the first place. Through its loss, it seems to have existed. So you feel you've lost something. Mm -hmm. And in, in, in uh, anthropology, it's called the incest taboo, which is you are separated from the mother. You can no longer have private enjoyment at the mother's breast. You have to find substitute enjoyment in the world. And the, the incest taboo is everywhere in the world, which is just simply the the sense that you have to separate from the mother other that's what unifies us um that's what i think it's in jean paul sartre as well is that that there is not a solid there's a solidarity that we can it's somehow well you almost say it's somehow if we can embrace the our own discontent and not try to cover over it uh that is a radical political move and i'll give you one example like it's a marxist pure marxist example like the whole point, a conservative reading of capitalism is simply capitalism is, you know, the, the free exchange of goods on the open market, right? That's, cap that's the definition of capitalism, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, visible hand on the market, Adam Smith, whatever. And that's all very good, right? But of course, <laughs> the Marxist comes along and says, well, that covers over a contradiction. Yeah. And what's the contradiction that it covers over that's hidden? Well, the contradiction that everything in the free market gets its value. Everything gets its value in the free market as long as it works right. And I love this about Marxism. Marxism doesn't critique capitalism because of its failures. The left today, mm. I'm sorry for ranting, but the left today <laughs> criticize capitalism for not working well enough. It's almost like, well, we need more people of this race or this gender to be billionaires, to be millionaires, to have access to the means, right? <laughs> to, you know, to own the means of production, or whatever, right? In other words, oh, you know, capitalism should, um, uh, we just got to make it, make it work better. Mark says, let's imagine it works perfectly. Let's imagine it works absolutely perfectly where you go into the market with your iPhone. I sell it to you. I get the money it's worth because the market, the free exchange, I don't have to sell this phone. You don't have to buy it. We find an agreement, you know, brilliant. And of course, Marx says like, well, you know, there's one exception to this really. Whenever it's working well, it's like your labor power your labor power never gets its value, right? Because mm. precisely I'm going to buy your labor power for $50 a day because it makes me $100 a day, right? So, so there is this interesting contradiction that cannot be done away with. Like that is in the Canadian terms, a santom, not a symptom. It's a, it's a, it's a contradiction mm. that is not contingent. It's a contradiction that is inherent to the system itself. And then that contradiction Sometimes it's fine, does it, but eventually causes so much rupture and so much difficulty that, you know, one of the ideas was eventually that will just, that will collapse the system and something else will arise. Um, that's a good example of where the, the conservative traditionally covers over the contradiction. And therefore, when capitalism doesn't work, oh, it's because we don't have enough female CEOs, or it's because Starbucks isn't giving 20% or 10% of its money to fair trade coffee growers. It's because, right, so that's the conservative idea is like, oh yeah, we can get rid of the contradictions um, because they're contingent. The leftists will still go, yeah, absolutely, let's do all of those other things. There's nothing wrong with Starbucks is good, Starbucks giving some money to farmers, but there's an inherent necessary contradiction that can't be reduced used to a contingent opposition that can be cut away and um and it's and it's been uh looking at that inherent contradiction yeah thanks pete uh okay so um yeah just to kind of go on the record here uh completely agree that i think what i'm seeing there, there, in the american context is pretty interesting too because of our uh, civic system um how we don't we don't really have a uh, parliamentary democracy it's this first past the post system and so there's a lot there's a lot of pressure for leftist forces to get liquid liquidated into a kind of liberal capitalistic progressive um 
uh, party that it isn't leftist at, at all, it, 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 um, for reasons I think you're describing really well. And I actually think um, this term you used, the traditional left, I mean, that you talked about the power of words. That's quite twisted. That's quite an interesting formulation. It might strike people as odd. You don't typically associate the left with tradition. Tradition might be coded as conservative or reactionary, uh, but I, I quite like that uh, for, formulation. And I wonder if it would, so I'll just confess to something in the spirit of uh, confessional Christianity. I'll confess that I'm a deeply Christian spiritual person while being a leftist in, in America. This has been kind of a source of shame for me and a source of um, unconsciousness. Like I would go to church, go to politics, people on my communities aren't connected there at all. There's not a lot of leftists in church, obviously. I particularly like Orthodox Christianity and Catholicism too. Um, those are the things that really light me up. Typically in the American context, more reactionary politically and in the leftist context, um, not a lot of talk about Christianity, spirituality, theology going on. And actually your work on pyrotheology was very, uh, it really cracked me open. It was very interesting because I saw things, the litur liturgy and the theory being connected there. And so I'm wondering if uh, with that kind of small an anecdote, if we can fork into pyrotheology and then maybe we can circle back into the politics. Because I think our, an understanding for the audience of some of the key crucial ideas in pyrotheology might help to contextualize some of the points you were just making about the left. So I was wondering if, um, I'll cite your six part seminar on YouTube as a, as a reference here, um, which I just got finished watching again. And I'm wondering if you could take some time describing that, maybe what, what you're thinking when you're making the seminar, maybe what some of the themes, questions, and ideas that you're looking to raise in that seminar, things you can remember about it. Um, can we, can we discuss that for, for, for some moments and then Absolutely. maybe get back into the politics? Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, I made that little uh, six part series as kind of introduction because I realized there's so much stuff out there and it's hard for people that orient themselves if they're interested in what I'm doing. So that was like a little set of videos to kind of like provide maybe a kind of introduction. Um, you know, in, in some ways you could say religion and religion is very you know, hard to define. It's not even hard to define, it's just complex subject, but you could say in one way religions are ways of tarrying with the negative, uh, with, with what we cannot articulate. There's, um, now, funnily enough, scientists as well, but scientists are, are, are inspired at their best. They're inspired by what they do not know, not by what they do know, but what they do not know. That's the, that's the driving force. So it's part of to be human is to be driven by what you do not have. That's the nature of desire. The nature of desire is fundamentally to want what you don't have uh, and to be driven. And whenever you get something, you know, it often loses its, its, its kind of uh, lure and then you kind of move on to something else. So religion but is one of the areas of human life that is attempting to find words and uh, actions that to orient ourselves to this non-material dimension and i use non-material in its widest sense of uh, uh existence uh, that dimension of existence that is not kind of like something that is material but is being um and we can that includes mathematics two plus two equals four we can say it doesn't have, doesn't get old doesn't exist in that that i can touch you know it's a it's an eternal seemingly an eternal kind of thing um Whenever I do mathematics, whenever I say a triangle has three sides, I'm participating in the eternal. But anyway, so that's what religion is. And we have different ways of trying to, as human beings, orient ourselves to this dimension of what we do not have. And in our contemporary society, we're devastated by this. So often we are driven always by what we don't have. We want a bigger house. We want more money. We want to be with that person. We don't want to be with this person. We, we're 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 always fear of missing out, right? There's something happening that we're not getting. So we're we're tyrannized by this, this nothingness, this lack that we have. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm interested in how do we have a right orientation to this politically, personally, spiritually, philosophically. So um, in one way that those six courses in, in parotheology that it takes the idea that we, 
we often start with this idea that there is an object that we do not have. And if we did have it, we would be whole and complete. Something that if we could grasp, we would lack the lack. We would somehow feel oceanic oneness. And we often, this is this, this, we carry this with us from the from the incest to be really from the moment that we separate and we become subjects, we feel we've lost something. So we are fundamentally attuned to a loss. And I call this the sacred object, the object that if we could have would would make everything right. Um, and in paratheology, the first step conversion really is the existential experience event in which you realize that that sacred object does not exist, that it only exists in not having it. It exists in its non-existence. As soon as you get it, it dissipates, it dissolves. So we, we are caught in this weird place of the sacred object. Now, the funny thing is, Shizek talks about this, is often we know that the sacred object doesn't exist, right? We kind of know that in this world, there's nothing really going to satisfy us. But we often think there's an alternative world word exists, right? So we imagine, oh, if only I'd been with that person, then everything would have been great. So there's an alternative world where you're with that person and everything could have worked out, right? So in the real world, there's no sacred object or you've lost it, but in the possible world, it, it, it does exist. Um, a paratheological conversion is where the sacred object is dissipated, not only in the real world, but in every possible world. We realize that we wouldn't even want it if it did exist because it would get rid of our desire. And actually desire is what makes life meaningful and deep and rich. So that's the first step. And I'll just mention the second step very quickly and then you, know, we can, you can take it any direction you wanna go. Uh, the second thing is, is realizing, oh, uh, there's something else after the death of the sacred object. Cause that would be so depressing, pure, that's pure nihilism, right? Nothing. No. But is the realization that the sacred is not an object, but the sacred sacred is a depth dimension in in that you discover within objects. So the sacred is not an object that you love. The sacred is a depth dimension you experience in the act of love itself. That there is something about sacrifice and gift and um uh, not having that is actually satisfying and rich and meaningful. And, and that, and there is a, there is a theological uh, articulation of that. That's, that's what in apathetic theology is called God. God is the kind of ungraspable, uh, Simone Weil saw that the ungraspable treasure that generates your desire Um yeah, and so almost God is the quantum dimension of reality, the idea of a lack or non-oneness or asymmetry within reality that generates desire. And if we can orient ourselves to that, if we can enjoy not having, enjoy our desire, we will find ourselves um, leading a much richer and deeper life. Thank you, Pete. Thank you. Yeah, this kind of centering of desire and, and lack as it relates to... Uh... Uh, theological questions like the search for you now would typically think of something like salvation or uh yeah heaven uh king the kingdom of heaven in the kind of new age versions like kingdom of heaven on earth now like some kind of utopia on earth um and so i, I find this uh critique of pyro theology of of no it's the it's not the con uh constituting utopia it's the kind of as one the recognition of um, that this wouldn't make us happy, but then also an affirmation of the process of, of, of seeking it almost. It's kind of, that's kind of how I see it. It's kind of a, cause you're right. You have the first negative view, um, which I do find liberating um, and, and enjoyable. Like just let go of, um, I'll often think of this in the uh, context of like self-improvement, um, letting go of the, these ideals, but then the, there is an affirmation of desire um, that, uh, in pyrotheology, is that correct? I just want to make sure I'm grasping the point you're making yes. for it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it basically, it's the idea that um, that if you got rid of sacrifice, if you sacrifice sacrifice, which is another uh, fantasy within contemporary society, is that we often think, I'll work hard and then I'll be able to get the house I want, retire by the beach. Basically, sacrifice, sacrifice. I'll be able to enjoy my retirement and just sit back and read a good book or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but not realizing that 
that it actually sacrifices what makes life meaningful. It's and, and gift is a type of sacrifice where you know you give something without any exchange, without any return, right? So it's non-economic. Um, that sacrifice and gift giving is is actually what renders yeah is what renders our lives deep and meaningful. So the issue is not to sacrifice sacrifice to get rid of desire to get rid of this longing, but rather is to kind of like have a type of sacrifice that is that we all benefit from. So for example, within our society, lots of people sacrifice, but they sacrifice without getting the benefit of the sacrifice. So they sacrifice and some other people get the benefit of the sacrifice. And that's even, so even the winners lose because whenever you just get stuff uh, without sacrifice, you end up in kind of melancholy. It's a very meaningless kind of life, but the losers lose doubly because they're in suffering and physical and poverty. Uh, pain and and also psychological distress. So the idea is that how do we all sacrifice and all get the benefit of sacrifice? Can we think of a society in which sacrifice is is of course a central dimension of it? Desire, desire is a central dimension of of it. But um, but in a way, it's shared by everybody and everyone benefits. Thank you, Pete. Here's a question that comes to mind as you're talking about that. I'm curious about theology, like maybe even broader, uh, a broader question. I, one thing I love about your work is um, you take some insights from your research and you can apply them in very convincing ways to fields like psychoanalysis, politics, you know, day-to-day -day community building. Um, you even uh, make uh, some interesting, like I see them as like isomorphisms between like democracy, evolution, um, I'm forgetting some stuff from uh, incompleteness theorem, mm -hmm. um, things from the natural sciences as well. I'm curious, like, why, what about theology makes it, uh, what, what, what about a kind of deep study of theology allows you to make these kind of convincing, uh, to, to analyze these kind of disparate fields in a real convincing way? It seems like there's something very structural about some of the insights yeah. you got from your study of theology and like, Honestly, that was surprising to me at first. Uh, um, it kind of is intuitively landing for me. It makes sense, but I wouldn't have thought like search theology to find this kind of fundamental insight that seems to apply um, across many different disciplines. So like, can you talk a little bit about why do you think, what about the study of theology makes it so uh, insightful to kind of dis disparate fields? Um, do you have a sense of that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's beautifully counterintuitive. That's why I quite like it. Um, and it's maybe one of the areas that people understand least about the work of Slavoj Žižek, for example, is they don't know why he every now and again says that he's a Christian and why he writes theology books. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, so I love the counterintuitive nature of it because I'm not simply claiming that there are insights in theology. I mean, I'm kind of making, carefully I'm making the claim that there is a theological heartbeat to this and of course i'm not the only one what are benjamin and others like but um but there is but it still is is definitely again in the contemporary left um this is this is not seen at all and by the way the main problem where where i think the left went wrong um was early on in um feuerbach uh basically after hegel the left um took on Hegel's notion of the dialectic, but they ditched his notion of the state and of religion and of Christianity. So that's what was kind of kicked out. So with, with when then you have humanism with Feuerbach, and I, I actually really like Feuerbach, I always, always liked him as a philosopher, but, but the, the big issue with Feuerbach is God is a projection of the self, of, of the human community. The God is the, the screen upon which we come to understand ourselves. So it's the very first, it's a, or not first, but it's a very powerful projection theory. You see it then in, in Freud, that in order to come to know ourselves, we must first externalize our essence and then see it and then take it back into ourselves. But with this, Feuerbach lost Hegel's central notion of, um, uh, of religion, which is for Hegel, Christianity is the dialectic, eternally driven, right? Once you get rid of Hegel's Christianity, you're tempted to believe that the dialectic can be resolved. You open the door to the notion that there is an end of history, not in Hegel's sense of the term, but an end of history in the sense of, oh, we can, 
we could get to a point at which uh, there is no longer a kind of contradiction or asymmetry at the heart of reality. Um, that's Todd McGowan's claim. So in his book, Emancipation After Hegel, he makes the very good claim that, that by kicking out the, 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 the Christian Hegel, the left actually lost something that you can see the name of it is Stalinism, right? The name of it is uh, uh, where history, there is an end point. There is like a progressivism is also the, the problem. The progressivism is the natural result of the left kicking out Hegel's Christianity. Um, and I know that's a question we, we want to come to later. So um, uh, the reason for this central claim is that uh, there is this notion if, like if if you go, let's imagine it's true for a second, and I, you, the thing you're referencing is I talk about how incompleteness or asymmetry or contradiction is found in all the major disciplines, right? Like in biology, it's called evolution, the non-oneness of the biological organism with itself and its environment. Within mathematics, the incompleteness theorem, the idea that mathematical axioms cannot prove themselves, they fall into a contradiction. Um, within physics, we can talk about quantum indeterminacy and asymmetry at the beginning of the kind of singularity. Um, in, in terms of uh, psychoanalysis, the unconscious, which is the the non at oneness of the subject with itself, right? So th these ideas you can find kind of in, in these various scientific disciplines. Uh, theology came to it very early with the notion of crucified Christ, which is a God who is not at one with God. Um, the, that, the eternal and the temporal. Uh, so Kierkegaard is very important here, obviously, but it goes back further than that. This notion that there's a contradiction in the very image of the God man, right? There is this fundamentally irreconcilable ontological contradiction that that then is kind of played out in various fields. Now, on a very pragmatic note as well, I should say, when I said I did continental philosophy, it was actually scholastic philosophy. So they had an analytic department and scholastic department. And so I did scholastic philosophy, which is really continental philosophy. We did scholastics. And I find that all of the theological debates and discussions that they were having are so contemporary. Like there's nothing new under the sun. You know, you read people like Aquinas, he's dealing with subjects that have a different content, but the same structural form, right? So you can take all of those theological concepts, debates and discussions, and you can apply them to contemporary understandings. And what I discovered is that now, it's a very radical, it's what's called radical theology, to tradition that um, in this notion of a crucified God, um, of a God of the complete outsider, of a God of the, what's called the canonic God, the God of complete emptiness, you have the uh, image of uh, the contradiction that is reality itself. That's basically the theological name for that. And the cure salvation is to identify with that contradiction. Um, which, by the way, which, in psychoanalysis, like it's kind of to simplify terribly, the cure in psychoanalysis for a neurotic can be to, to identify with your own symptoms, identify with mm -hmm. your own contradictions, not overcome your contradictions, like in counseling and form, certain forms of therapy and cognitive therapies, but rather to embrace the contradiction that you are. Um, so, so that again, that's that's so what you call salvation in Christianity is called the cure in psychoanalysis. Right. So thank you, Pete. That is enormously helpful. This and it reminds me, it's circling back to previous thread of our conversation about you know the interesting place we find ourselves in, in a contemporary sense where maybe the left is obscuring more so obscuring contradiction. Um where and you know, maybe we can trace the, the symptom back to a kind of uh, Feuerbach or someone or early um, forces on the left kind of rejecting the Christianity of Hegel. Um, this is a very compelling thesis to me. And it's all, what you're saying is extremely compelling as well, uh, connecting the affirming the contradiction, you know, politically with maybe some ideas in counseling. I find it uh, theoretically extremely compelling, but I did want to put some pressure on it um, by um, talking about a very vulgar. We're I'm filming this on August 1st, 2022. So there's something happening. And I'm going to talk very concretely about Pennsylvania, where I live. 
And um, we have a governor's race happening in 2022. Um, like all in 2022, most political electoral engagements. I'll, I'll, I'll zoom back a little, kind of a research project on this channel right now, something we're calling electoral realism. Something that I think I'll, myself and many comrades, people I talk to, we feel that we're trapped in a system that's real, like ontologically real, like it's Democrats or Republicans, like this is the system and how it's always been. I wanna put pressure on this notion. Theoretically, it's easy for me to dissolve this, but practically and in, in, in practice, it feels impossible. And so I'll unpack that a little, and I'd love to hear um, like a, a pyro uh, uh, the theological critique of this electoral realism if we could uh, flush out. But so we've got a governor's race uh, between Democrat and a Republican. Republican is vowed full, full abortion ban at six weeks. Uh, he, will, he will get that because in Pennsylvania, very rural um, in between Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, so they control the legislator. The, legis uh, the legislature bodies. So if the governor wins, they will get that. Um, he's vowed, uh, interestingly, to make sure that, or, uh, he's basically said um, 2020 election in the US was a scam and we won't let that happen again. So uh, pretty explicit about that. Um, his opponent, uh, who's a Democrat, is a cop, uh, a uh, AG, uh, attorney general, and uh, supports fracking and drilling. And um, this puts the left, the avowed left, in a very difficult position um, because what do you, you know, what do you do? You know, the, just affirming this contradiction is, is challenging. I mean, it, 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 um, the, the stakes seem so high um, that it's very easy. And honestly, to, I can't, you know, it's hard for me to say uh, to really affirm this contradiction and not just get behind the, the bad candidate that's on the way on the avowed left or calling himself a, a left-wing politician. And I think this goes, if I could just flesh out, maybe give, be less vulgar and zoom out a little bit. You know, I think with counseling and um, therapy as well, like so work in addiction, uh, that's a hard thing to say is like, you're this heroin addiction, this alcohol addiction that is destroying everything. Affirming that is, is it's, a, it's a big lift um, practically. Um, and so I'm wondering if there are any responses to that or like what, in, in light of these very concrete things, can we bring back some of the ideas you're just explicating and maybe apply them uh, to, 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 to these kind of empirical examples I just offered? Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, and uh, this realism you're talking about, is like there's the old story of a guy looking for directions to Tipperary in Ireland and the farmer says to him, I wouldn't start from here. And they're like, yeah, so that's very unhelpful, right? <laughs> you have to start from here. <laughs> like yeah. the person is there. And so we can't just be, you know, like pretend, oh, well, let's start somewhere else. We've got to start where we are. You go, we start with the world that we're in. Um, and the Hegel was always very good at that. You always start, like the, the dialectic always begins where we stand right here, right now, whatever language or culture or world we're in. Um, we have to create momentum and movement. Um, it, it, so, yeah, I've got a few thoughts on that. Um, okay, so what... Pra uh, I like I have very little belief in uh, in kind of like party politics <laughs> and uh, the, the the power of that anyway. Um, uh, so what was what? So what does one do? Um, I mean, like in some respects, for me, like as a Hegelian, I go like the the role of a theorist in some respects is to articulate the contradictions to bring them to the surface to to allow them to arise so if if a couple are are, are in a bad relationship and they're not talking and uh, they've been like that for 10 years it's just a bad relationship and it's coming out in lots of ways their kid is anorexic or the guy's working too hard or the woman is having an affair or whatever it is there's all these symptoms but it's not being talked about then they go to a therapist and say the therapist helps them begin to bring all of the stuff to the surface, all the contradictions that everyone knows but doesn't know that they know, they bring it to the surface. Now, the, the therapist doesn't know whether this couple are going to stay together or separate. Don't know, no idea. All you do know is that once all of these contradictions are brought up to the surface, something has to give. The relationship can't continue as it is. Either they will break up and go, you know, do something else, or they'll break up with the type of relationship they've had in order to have a new type of relationship. Um, 
so in some respects, I do see traditionally the, the, the role of the left is to be prophets of the present, to kind of bring out the truth of these contradictions and show them and kind of make them apparent to people. Um, and then kind of like whenever those contradictions crack a little bit and open up a possibility, open up a way, then lean into that lean into that so it's kind of like a bringing to the surface a showing of things and then a leaning into things so like for example oh and this is, this is the reason why um for me political dialogue is needed because communities have an unconscious there's elements of your own community that you don't see your own intolerances your own violence your own whatever there's a blind spot within yourself and the other has a blind spot so when you engage, the other can help you see the blind spot within yourself, can help you. So the job, again, is to start showing the blind spots within communities. So for example, if there's a conservative community that's saying, um, we want biblical marriage, marriage between a man and a woman or whatever, right? Biblical Christian marriage. The idea is not to fight it, but to go, yes, we should have biblical marriage. We should have 13 year old girls marrying 20 year old men. We should have da da da, right? You kind of like affirm it to go, yeah, if you want biblical marriage, you've got like 12 year old kids getting married off because that's biblical. That's the Bible. Like Mary was like, I don't know, 13 years old. That was like, you, you want, do you want biblical marriage, right? And then suddenly that shows a contradiction that shows, oh, ah. I'm not actually affirming biblical marriage. I'm affirming something else. So again, it's kind of like you go the opposite direction to bring out the contradiction, to kind of expose the contradiction. Um, so when you're in a, the, the elections in America with um, Hillary Clinton and, and Trump and with Bernie Sanders, I mean, this is a great example of, it's an impossible situation, but it's like, but there was a moment of possibility and it, you know, we didn't get it, right? But um, there was a moment of possibility, like, the Democrats and the Republicans are both neoliberal parties, both neoliberal parties. Um, but there was a moment whenever a socialist and a nationalist were possibilities, right? Where both one bad, one good, but but both not neoliberal. That was interesting. Whichever side you go like, oh, two non-neoliberal candidates, that's that's interesting. That that's a possibility for a real change to happen. So that's not it's not maybe that's not a very practical answer, but it's it's going like uh, anyway. Do you want to jump back on that or ask anything no, else? I do think it's 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 helpful just from understanding is there it's an understanding of <laughs> there's something intrinsically good about just kind of how we were doing raising recognizing like this is the electoral situation right now, but raising those contradictions, not just kind of unconsciously uh, supporting the less bad candidate. Be like, wait a second. Like, I feel like I should support this candidate, but there's many contradictions. I don't like this about my, uh, this doesn't feel good. Um, just not, as there's a lot of pressure um, to kind of repress those, because like, you no, know, shh, don't, don't, we don't want to give material support to the other other guy. Um, just, yeah. uh, there's something from a theoretical level, it's, it's good about ra raising contradiction. And it, the role of that theory doesn't necessarily have to like, give uh, like you you, you um, talked about with the, the analysts it might not have a step plan to fix the relationship that's not the point of the analysis it's to raise uh things that are uh, unconscious to the surface um and there's something intrinsically good about doing that even if we don't like what we're seeing or something or if there's no good options or if it's doomed or or or, or, or whatever there's something valuable that could um open up possibilities for new things emerging. That's kind of what I was hearing from. Yeah, and, and like, <laughs> with those two examples of fracking and abortion, these are full of contradictions, you know, and these are full yeah. of trying to understand, you know, the first task is to understand, you know, is to kind of understand what's what's within and what's behind these things. Like abortion's fascinating because, because of how impossible it is to solve. And like in terms of like, uh, you know, there's so many dimensions, um, I was actually thinking about, I was trying to take a Hegelian perspective on, on abortion and kind of um, to kind of like uh, figure out whether I could think of a way that could mutually be, everyone would hate, but in a way that would, um, when everybody feels unhappy, then everyone's happy, you know? But, but again, it's like, uh, we have to try to understand, like in fracking is a good example, because, you know, of course, energy is the most important thing, you know, like with energy, we're, we're an energy, 
the, the modern world is built on the, the need to produce vast amounts of energy and there are crises and that in, uh, there's poverty issues with that you know whenever gas prices go up people can't afford to get to work so there's so so they're going like we well, how do we generate energy and there's no easy answers these are these are questions that are full of contradictions and if we make it too easy this is my problem well one of my many problems with instagram but whenever something's reduced to an instagraphic right it's 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 a it's a simple answer that is never right <laughs> like when it, reducing these complex issues um leads to kind of like othering and leads to very simple kind of like us and them mentalities and somehow we have to we have to raise the contradictions to the surface and with the belief that that leads to something change and this is the difference between progressive as an apocalypticism which i know you were wanting to chat about but yeah a progressive is often a person who thinks well they're but they've got a teleological curve of history they know where things are going and if i disagree with you as a progressive i can love you in a patronizing way i can try to convince you why you're wrong but kind of know where things are progressing i know basically where the end point is i know what the kingdom of heaven is right um apocalypticism is the political position where you go, I do not know the future. I don't know what the next epoch is gonna look like. All I know is that we have to have conflict, that we have to be able to sit in a room and fight and argue, and I need to be able to listen to you so as I can see the blindness within myself and vice versa. We don't know what the future holds, but we know that if we can, we can stay in the same room and argue and fight and bring this to the surface, eventually, the system as it presently is will not hold and something new will arise. So apocalypticism is a kind of openness to a future that you cannot predict in advance because all of our present predictions of the future are idealized reflections of our, our current values, right? That's why we imagine our st stories are all about fairy tales are about poor people becoming rich, single people getting married. You go to a different country, it's about a rich person renouncing their wealth and becoming poor, a person who was in a relationship getting out and becoming single. Right? Our, our, our fantasies, whenever you say fulfill your dreams, they're just idealized reflections of, your, of the present. Just like sci-fi movies are idealized reflections of the present. They're never about the future, they're about the present. Um, apocalypticism attempts to avoid the idolatry of the future by saying that our role is to is to give ourselves over to the democratic chaos of asymmetry. Thanks, Pete. Yeah, this is an amazing segue into and what you just said at the end there about progressivism and apocalypticism. So uh, Pete did a really fascinating. I'm going to link to some of the sources uh, seminar on this topic that has been really uh, thought provoking for me. And so you just talked about it a little bit, but I'm wondering if we can dig into that for a few minutes. Um, this idolatry of the future idea, uh, just very, uh, very invigorating, but um, could you maybe talk a little bit about, um, and going back to this electoral realism thing, like I think the tyranny of progressivism or this idea of that we know what the future should be and we need to work on that. I mean, I think that's very entrenched, at least in my thinking and in my communities right now. And so I find this apocalypticism idea going back to like the traditional left idea. So, so apocalypticism, this is a theological term. Um, this is a, there's a whole tradition and lineage coming out of this. Can you tell us a little bit about um, what, what is apocalypticism? Like how have you kind of appropriated or built and critiqued on that, that lineage for yeah. your thinking in pyrotheology? And um, how does that relate to some of the discussions we've been having? Um, could you take a yeah. shot at that? <laughs> Absolutely. And so in one way, you could say that we there's a there's a future we can predict, um, and that is like I know what I'm going to do after this. I'm going to go to the coffee shop probably. Really, there's a book I'm reading. I'm going to read a little bit more of that. You know, that's the kind of, and I can be reasonably confident that that happens. Um, and then there's the future that is an event, is eventful that you cannot predict. Uh, you know, the moment you fall in love, or um, you know, someone who's young just dies all of a sudden and whatever but something happens that that you could not have known in advance it was like it was outside of that realm of possibility and that's kind of like the apocalyptic future and the or the eventful future and so within within religion yeah there is this notion of apocalypse which is the 
the kind of the end of everything as you know it and then the beginning of something that you cannot predict or know or whatever and there's something about being open to and in philosophy I say it's called the event evental the evental dimension of reality um, and a really concrete example of it is from Northern Ireland where the peace process was apocalyptic like Everybody had an idea of what Northern Ireland should be, who should be United Ireland, should be part of the United Kingdom. You know, this is the way you should do it. Despite, um, you know, get rid of the police force, change police force, keep it. Well, lots of views and opinions. But we were ultimately destroying ourselves and the, the fights between paramilitary groups and it was becoming completely intolerable. And eventually everybody was like, oh, crap, we're going to have to we're gonna have to sit down and talk to each other. Um not for moral reasons, not because it's the right thing to do or because we like the person or whatever. It's like, we are just going to be destroyed otherwise. And so everybody got together. The major paramilitary organizations did a ceasefire. Uh, the, all the major governments, south, north, north and south and London kind of agreed. And then there was this process called the Good Friday, which became the Good Friday Agreement. Which I and I love that it was signed on Good Friday, which is the contradiction, the death of God, that you know that Hegelian notion. Um, so, and it was people going, okay, we don't know what the future of Northern Ireland is going to be. We just have to stay in this room, and I think they stayed there for three days or something, and just argued it out, argued it out, and radical moves were made. They disbanded the police force, the RUC, and they created a new police force, PSNI, and they. They we did the special status stuff and got rid of the border and nobody could have imagined what it was going to look like, but it was a kind of sense in which the conflict had become so bad that something had to give and something had to change and we were all part of it because that's the other thing it's not like one part of the community knows the answer eventually you'll be shown that I'm right and you're going to have to say I can say I told you so it's like no we're all in society together we are all neighbors. I share this social space with you. We all have to get into this conflict. And the and as Hegel says, the oil of Minerva spreads her wings at dusk, which is basically a way of saying that wisdom only kind of gathers reality once everything has happened at nightfall, right? So in a way, it's like philosophy doesn't predict the future. Philosophy at its best brings up the contradiction and the political act here is the bringing up of the contradiction for change to happen. Thanks, Pete. Yeah, this brings, okay, so uh, connecting this kind of almost like an anti-methodology, but this, this uh, practice of centering and focusing on the contradiction and not like, to use the Ireland example, like not some kind of technocratic planned peace process, but more so the violence became untenable and that, like acted like a punctured equilibrium or something like that. It's almost an explosion into a new way of being that's quite ra radical and profound. Um, yes. Um, I'm, I'm full of contradiction because now we are part of Ireland, part of the UK, part of Europe, part of yeah. England, Great Britain, you know, like we, uh, the Northern Ireland is, and we've got a city called Derry, Stroke Londonderry, right? So depending on the name of this one city, but if you're <laughs> nationalist or Catholic or Republican, you you will call it Derry. If you're loyalist, Protestant or Unionist, you'll call it Londonderry. So depending on where you are, you call it. And so what happened is eventually all the all of the journalists talked about it as Derry Stroke Londonderry, so as not to offend anybody. So you say Derry <laughs> Stroke Londonderry. And then eventually um, this well-known news presenter just called it Stroke City. So Stroke uh, it City. became known as Stroke City. And Stroke City being the stroke between Derry and Londonderry, which huh. is a beautiful image of the unconscious. Not one, not two, but not one, which is Trinitarian, by the way. So the Trinity is interesting because some people think the universe is one, monists right you know everything is one and we're all one some people think the universe is two dualists um you know the uh, uh darkness and light masculine feminine chaos order um some people think that of the world is multiplicity delusions everything is pure multiplicity and difference um but what if the universe is dialectic which is the universe is not one or two or many the universe is not one which is in other words you've got dairy Londonderry and the stroke, Trinity, three in one. You've got God, who is not at one with God, with the name of that is Jesus. And then you have the split itself, which is 
the Holy Spirit, um, which is, um, so there's a Trinitarian dimension to being itself. Oh yeah, and politically speaking, um, it is encountering the non-at-oneness and uh, that which which generates change and transformation. Yeah, fa fascinating. I uh, can't wait to visit uh, Stroke City one day. It just seems oh, like yeah. a great, great place uh, okay. to explore some of these topics. Um, okay, so maybe there's one, maybe two more questions, Pete. And I think that what you just said was a great segue into this idea of maybe we could just accept this idea that uh, it's good to bring up the kind of fundamental contradictions, bracket some of the kind of kind of futurism which is just a reflection usually an ideal idealized fraction you've talked about it like with the jetsons and some of your seminars which are, i really like that example oh, uh yeah uh um but um what in your view are some of the fundamental contradictions of our time um and how can people feel into those or, or, or explore if, if because to me it's very natural to envision change turning and facing contradiction is more difficult. Um, so I guess there's two questions here is like, how does one do that? How, 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 how do we do that? And then in your view, um, what, what do you see as some of the fundamental contradictions of this moment now that, you know, we're just kind of epochally, um, um, what, are, what are some of the fundamental contradictions? Does anything come to mind? Yeah, I mean, and, and that's where it might be useful to kind of use this, this Lacanian idea, there's a symptom and the santom. Um, Symptoms are kind of coagulations of contradictions. So if I if I'm gripping my teeth, it might be because I want to say something, but I also am scared to say it. And so the 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 when I wake up in the morning and I've been gritting my teeth, that's a symptom. And maybe through doing therapy, I start to realize, oh yes, I want to say something to my partner, but I'm scared that if I say it, they will leave me. So this symptom is the coagulation of that contradictory desire. But then, you know, then that comes up when we talk about that and I realize that that maybe reflects, oh, that reflects actually my relationship with my siblings. You know, I always felt that I couldn't say certain things. I was scared of saying certain things. So that contradiction is resolved through, through going to a deeper contradiction. And eventually you keep going down this rabbit hole and then you come to the contradiction that that you are, which is, oh, that between a contradiction between life and death and a contradiction between speaking and not speaking, being able to say something, but never being able to say what you want to say because we never are able to. Um, and then that's kind of the cure where you get to this fundamental santom. So in a similar way, there's lots of symptoms in society, homelessness, prison population issues, like lots of, lots of symptoms. Um, and what we do is we start by looking at those but as we go deeper and deeper, we find some of those can be dissipated. Some of those can be resolved within the current system. But we eventually get down to a santon. We get down to a fundamental contradiction that cannot be gotten rid of without getting rid of the system itself. Right? That's the, really the santon. The santon is, is, is a contradiction that when you pull that contradiction apart, you pull yourself apart. I actually think, um, I think some drugs do this. Like I think... Uh, like 5-MeO-DMT, for example, is probably an example of uh, pulling apart the symptom of the ego. So in Lacanian psychoanalysis, the ego is a symptom, right? So it's a, it's a coagulation of a contradiction between competing desires, the, you know, id and superego and all of that. So the ego itself is a, is a symptom. And then maybe a certain drugs that do briefly unpick the symptom. And as it unpicks the symptom, you disappear, right? You, you unpick that symptom and you no longer exist. It's a santom. Well, our current our current system has a santom. And it's and it is that labor power never gets its value. <laughs> and um uh, and that there's a fundamental alienation within our society, within how we work. And that is why, for me, my political position is one of two things. Uh, if I went into business, I would have maybe set up a cooperative. Um, uh, but I went into this work of power of theology where I want to create communities in which we are freed from the frenetic pursuit of some sacred object that we think will fulfill us. We're, we're freed from the tyranny of happiness, the tyranny of satisfaction. We're able to embrace a certain unknowing, a certain dissatisfaction, a certain sacrifice. Both of these, I think, are fundamental resistances to 
the con the contemporary the contemporary society contemporary issue. So um, that's you know that's that makes me that's why I'm an old school. You know, I I, hear, I don't I want to use different like that's why I call myself a Hegelian as I want to say no I'm a dial if my politics is dialecticism that's my politics okay. but uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Pete, uh, just because of something you said, um, we're a little over the time we set. Is is it okay for one more? I can edit oh, yeah, this out. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so you talked there about this fundamental using some of the uh, words that come out of uh, the Lacanian register, which is just fascinating about the symptom and symptom. How do you say it again? The the, the more fundamental symptom. Uh, Santom. Santom. Santom which is spelled. Uh... S Y T H O M, I think, Saint so which comes from the French word. So it sounds, what's, I mean, Lacan loves his, uh, 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 I always find it hard to say that word, neologisms. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> no, it plays on word, but because um, Saint Tom sounds like holy man in French, Saint Tom. And so your the symptom is the holy man, the 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 prophet that tells the truth that you cannot speak. So he's, they're playing on this kind of the Saint Tom as a type of speech. But anyway, Saint Tom. Okay, so yeah, using that, we can have we can have like a what seems to me is like a kind of deep understanding of a kind of Marxist class analysis, right? Like uh, that's what that's what we're doing. So what I wanted to ask you, after this has just been tying me up the knots, uh, thinking about through some of your work, is how to kind of salvage that kind of class analysis, that fundamental contradiction, in the light of uh, Gerard's work on scapegoating. Because it seems to me very natural to scapegoat the oppressive, you know, the the one side of the dialectic. It just seems very intuitive and natural. And, you know, feeling alienated, feeling exploited. I there's in me at least an affective affective response to that, and it goes into this. It, often I find myself getting into the trap of scapegoating. Um, and so it's interesting to hear you have that kind of class analysis, but you also have a very rigorous understanding and drawn Gerard, correct me if I'm wrong, but quite a lot with the scapegoating. So I'm, I'm curious um, how, maybe I'm just kind of personally asking, but also theoretically, like rec reconciling those viewpoints. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's central. I mean, so René Girard's work, again, brings us right into the heart of theology because he beautifully articulates that. He says that basically the heart of Christianity is a breaking of the scapegoat mechanism. And if you see the scapegoat mechanism as as, as exactly what Todd McGowan means when he says reducing contradiction to opposition, um, then you know we're, we're connecting that theological tradition deeply with with Christianity, which, by the way, I think is the right link. The wrong link is so you know you're saying about you know your personal confession of Christian life and and your leftism. Like there's a variety, a variety of ways you can connect those. You can connect those through liberation theology. You can connect those through people like you know, uh, Terry Eagleson, who I respect deeply. And, as a, as a does some really interesting work, Christian Marxism, but I think that's still the wrong way to go. <laughs> I think the right way to go is um, with Thay Girard and um, Shizek and others. It's a much more radical notion. And that's, can I say a few things? I'm actually going to I'm going to do a podcast about this myself. Hopefully today, actually. Um, I was thinking about I've been reading this great book by uh, Richard Boothby called Sex on the Couch. Really recommend it. But um, He's talking about whenever Freud said, what does what does a woman want at the end of his life? That famous question, which is often seen as, you know, Freud not knowing women's desire and the enigma of the of the feminine desire. But really, you know, one of the things he means is what he discovered very pragmatically in the clinic was that a lot of women that he was talking to, um, their desire, their fantasy life was very driven by the fantasy life of the masculine structure. So for example, feminine structure is someone, and I've had a friend say this to me once, she said, well, my fantasy is whatever turns the guy on, right? So that, that's a very feminine fantasy, right? A feminine fantasy is less sedimented than male fantasy generally. Male fantasies can often be very specific and sedimented, whereas often you'll find, not exclusively, so a feminine fantasies are much more fluid and they can get into the fantasy of the other, right? So they can, but at first go, that's weird. But then what they desire is, is the desire of the fantasy of the other so they can kind of get into it, right? But the point is that well, Freud noticed this and he was like, oh, so what, what, does, what, does, what does the woman want? In that he was discovering that their want was tied up to the want of the other. 
their desire is tied up to the desire of the other. Now, then Lacan comes along, he universalized this. He says, yes, Freud was exactly right. And Freud was kind of, he had this insight, but he died. You know, he couldn't do everything, couldn't live forever. So Lacan says, well, this question, what Freud discovered about feminine fantasy and desire is universal. It's universal of male desire. It just looks a bit different, masculine desire. But ultimately, our desire is always the desire for the other's desire. Our desire is always, to some extent, framed and understood through what the other desires. So if I give you a concrete example, your partner says to you um, that, oh, I would love to have sex when somebody's watching. And the, the, say I say it's my partner and she goes like, uh, oh, never thought about that. Now, that sounds a bit weird. I don't really like it. But then she sees the, the how much it animates me. So she kind of maybe talks about it with me and she starts to like how much desire that I start to give because she's saying it. And then she starts to kind of like the idea. And then maybe we try it out, right? what she she's not really desiring at first the thing but what she's desiring is the desire that it it evokes and then the representation of that desire is the act and then you know she might get into the act right and vice versa for men whatever so um anyway saying all of that to say that for freud and for gerard what we're discovering is that our desire is never just our desire it's woven into the other it's woven into wider systemic issues same with political desire that often our enemies and our political enemies actually articulate something of our desire that we may not be aware of, that we may not understand, that we kind of have to begin to become aware of, um, uh, to, to realize that we are all kind of interconnected. That are, and so that's, and that's the Girardian notion, is the Girardian notion is, and it, you get it in the crucifixion, that my, my lack, I put it onto Jesus, right, in that, in that tradition. So I project onto this person all of my lack there, the problem. And then I discover they're innocent, they're God. And actually the lack that I put onto them is my own. So now I have to take it back into myself, which is salvation, right? So in the same way, I'm attacking some group. Let's call them Karens. That's my favorite example at the moment because that was a thing that was for a while. These women who would complain. And we all loved it because we all loved to like slag them off and whatever. But like we were very unfair because we were often just seeing little snippets and little clips and not seeing the full context and not seeing whether the person had mental illness or whether the person was just stressed or whether the other person provoked them, you know. But so maybe then we realized, maybe we saw a wider video once and we went, oh, I judged that person on that three second video. And then I find out, oh, I ruined them. They got lost their job. They were destroyed. And, and I participated in that that destruction of that person's entire life. And I go like, oh, that was me. That wasn't in her, that was in me. So that's the salvatory moment. That's the moment where you embrace, you realize the other is God, the other is the, the absolute, and you then you take that back on board. So that's that's how that connects with René Girard, I think. Oh, and then politically, I imagine, oh yeah, this connects with Marxism. The Marx, Marx, Oh, hardly wrote anything about communism, as you know, a few pages, whatever. Um, because his whole thing was about bringing up the contradictions that currently exist, not theorizing and fantasizing the future. And if there's a critique of Marx, the critique is the few times he did that, you know, he probably, you know, shouldn't have. <laughs> well, thanks, Pete. Very, very, very interesting bringing this idea of uh, Girard's kind of critique of like mimetic desire or this understanding of mimetic desire connecting that with the, the uh, kind of internalizing our inner Karen and applying that to uh, to some of these uh, Marxist discussions. I find it absolutely fascinating. I'm really thankful uh, for that answer in the entire discussion. Been extremely generous with your uh, time this morning. I know there's books to read and things okay. to get onto and uh, exciting podcasts about sex on the couch that we're all looking forward to. Um, and, and speaking of that, um, so imagine people listening to this, uh, some heard your work before, others might be coming across for the first time. Uh, I mean, I guess first, what are you up to, to now? Uh, where can we find out about that? How can we get involved with your work? Um, I'll cite everything wherever people are finding this uh, podcast, but could you talk a little bit about what comes next for you and where we can find your work? Yeah, so I'm actually finishing a book at the moment. I took time off writing for a while because I wrote what I wanted to write, taking time off, and now I'm getting back into it. So I'm writing a book, which is uh, taking up some of my time at the moment. Um, and the best way in for, for people who are interested in these ideas is probably these podcasts. Um, I find like 
these podcasts are the best way uh, to kind of discover someone's work. So there's loads of them out there. You stick my name in and I pick one that looks interesting. I did one with Pete Holmes, uh, a friend of mine. He's a great guy and he that's a good one. It's an early one. So podcasts are a good spot. I'm obviously YouTube. There's lots of stuff on YouTube. Um, and then from there, I do the odd live event and I do courses and all of all of the above. So, yeah. Awesome. Awesome, Pete. Great suggestions. Uh, we'll make sure to do that. This will have to be, it's another tangent topic for a different discussion, or maybe you could talk about it sometime. I, uh, big reader, have a lot of books behind me. I'm, uh, I won't say ashamed, I'll say interested to note that at, probably more than, I've experienced your work probably more than any theologian and never read one word. Um, I've listened to all your podcasts, seen your videos for, um, on the on Patreon. I find that to be a very interesting phenomenon. Um, it's very of our time. Um, yes. So I, I like from a media theory perspective, I'm very cu curious about that. And you're, there's a lot of stuff you're doing that's really interesting. I will commit now uh, on the record to reading your new book and getting some of the, uh, s s some of the books you've written. But I just wanted to note that um, is that Pete has a huge backlog of podcasts and uh, YouTube videos and interesting uh, short form parables, stuff that's re really cool. Um, and yeah, uh, yeah, maybe a topic for a different right. discussion. Like, but you're absolutely right. I mean, and I, I actually, I consider myself a communicator of which writing is just one small bit and actually the smallest bit for me, I never recommend my books because I go like, ah, you know, you know what I like, because this is my chosen mode of communication. And then the odd time I'll write a book and I'll be happy with it. So I'm excited about the new book, but yeah, it's funny in this. And I'm so lucky that we're in this age of technology because otherwise, well, I mean, I do like writing, but that would be my only means. So yeah. I love this because this, this just suits me. I love this back and forth. I love podcasting. I love that, that, that we're almost, we're in a golden age of communication again and of the public intellectual. And um, yeah, more so people can get incredible interaction with, theorists um and not necessarily sit down with their book you know and and so Todd McGowan's a great example I love Todd McGowan's books fantastic books but I also love that I can uh listen to his YouTube channel and you know hear him speak in a way that I would never have been able to 10 20 years ago so yeah yeah as someone struggling through the phenomenology of uh, spirit and also um Emancipation after Hegel. I do wish uh, Hegel would have had a YouTube channel. I don't know if he would have used it, but uh, that would have been very clarifying and helpful. But well, so. I don't know because I've heard that Hegel was a, a nightmare of a lecturer as well. <laughs> oh, gosh. So at least Maybe. you would have had lots of uh, Hegelian <laughs> YouTubers. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe, yeah, 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 may have been worse actually. Okay. Uh, thanks, Pete. This has been great. Really appreciate your time, and uh, look forward to seeing what you do next. Uh, have a good one. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah.